A generational shift is underway in the politics of this country as millennials increasingly outnumber baby boomers at the polls. They are the first cohort of digital natives and they bring with them not just new technologies but new attitudes and expectations of our democratic institutions. Joining us now to take stock of how the digital era is changing our political culture and practice we welcome back in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Graham Steele, that province's former Minister of Finance and the author of The Effective Citizen, How to Make Politicians Work for You. In Montreal, Quebec, via Skype, Ian Capstick, founder of the Ottawa-based public affairs agency Media Style and the social impact platform Camp. In the nation's capital, Katie O'Malley, political reporter and TVO.org contributor, and Susan Delacorte, columnist at the Toronto Star and author of Shopping for Votes, how politicians choose us, and we choose them. And here in our studio, Edward Greenspawn, President, CEO of the Public Policy Forum, and Peter Lowen, Director of the School of Public Policy and Governance and Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto. And we are delighted to welcome the cast of Ben-Hur to our program today as we have <laughs> every imaginable angle of this story covered. Uh, let's start in the nation's capital. Katie, um, Canadian millennials are going to be eligible to vote in the next federal election, and in doing so, they are apparently going to surpass baby boomers as the largest voting bloc out there. Here's the question. Is there evidence that they think about politics differently than the way their parents did? Oh, I think so, definitely, because it is, as, as you said, uh, they've, all, they've never really had to deal with a society where they couldn't just uh, check a Twitter feed or Facebook to see here directly from a politician and to kind of both hear the views expressed and express their own. At the same time, I do wonder how much that same uh, sort of transformation is actually changing how baby boomers look at politics. Like, I'm not sure they're preserved in amber, and just because they're a generation ahead means that they don't take advantage of those sorts of uh, the, the various social media platforms and the new access they have to politicians. I think it's the, 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 the change that it's wreaking on politics is wider than just one generation. I think it, it kind of, it, it, it transcends mere year of birth and it's affecting everything. Well, that's interesting, Susan, because I would have assumed that the, um, you know, old fogies like me still like to sit down at the end of the day and watch the news and get an actual newspaper to read uh, as opposed to uh, the digital natives who are doing everything online. Uh, do you think Katie's right in as much as we are all sort of merging together in the way that we understand and appreciate politics today? I sat in on a really interesting uh, session at the Manning Institute conference in Ottawa last month, and Hamish Marshall, who will be Andrew Shear's campaign chair, was talking about uh, demographics and uh, going after voters, and he actually rejects the idea that age is an indication of one's political bent. He said, uh, it, whether you're married or not, for example, it's, it's your life choices rather than your life happenstance that has a bigger effect on, on how you vote. Married people have more in common with married people than 20-year-olds have with other 20-year-olds, for example. So I, I was sort of persuaded by that. I think um, uh, on the stage with him was David Coletto, the, um, the pollster who's made quite a career out of, uh, of, of saying there is a difference in millennial voters and millennials as a political entity. But um, uh, I, I I'm sort of persuaded by the idea that, that it is what you choose to do in life that, uh, that influences how you vote. I do wonder, though, Ed, and you as a former editor of the Globe and Mail would have a view on this, millennials don't sit down over breakfast with a, with a hard newspaper the way that you and I did back in the day. Does that not, in spite of what Susan said and what Hamish had to say, does that not necessarily mean that they just approach politics and their understanding of how to participate in it differently from the way that we did? Well, I, I, I think that they do, Steve, and I think even before you get to the breakfast table, you know, that's ingrained in their behaviors as things were ingrained in our behaviors. We're the products of generations that have certain propensities towards them. And in this generation, uh, these kids grew up uh, in schools with environmentalism being very prominent, uh, with the threat of climate change uh, hanging over them. I think many kids have sensitized their parents uh, towards climate change. I think there's some evidence that uh, kids are, are much younger Canadians uh, not all millennials are kids anymore, but people growing up that generation feel much more natural with what we're calling inclusion today. It's kind of uh, more automatic for them. It's not everybody, but it's a propensity. And, and there was some uh, analysis after the last federal vote that if you pulled the millennials out of the vote, that the conservatives and liberals would have been in a dead heat. Uh, so they were the ones who threw the, the, who threw the liberals over the top. Hmm. And, and, you know, they went liberal, NDP, 
and then conservative. So uh, I think that is a value shift that we have to pay attention to. Peter, you're surrounded by these people in your classroom, so that, well, maybe not the 35, 36, 37 year olds, but certainly the younger end of the millennial generation. What are you seeing? Well, there's, there's, there's two things to note. I mean, one is that, you know, even 30 years ago, newspaper readership wasn't universal. Interest in politics wasn't universal, right? So even the decline in turnout that we've seen down the levels we've seen haven't been a decline from 100% down to 60%. It's been something like 75% down to, down to 60%. So the question is, you know, do these millennials look a lot like the people before them who voted or the people before them who didn't, who didn't vote? And my sense is that they look a lot more like people before them who did vote. They just approach politics differently. But they're, they're interested in politics to a certain degree. They follow it. Um, they just happen to have a lot more selection in terms of in, op, in variety in terms of what they can consume. So you know your newspaper set the agenda for you before, and now you have in front of you endless streams of, of data and news that you can that you can pursue. So it's much easier to learn about politics around the world, politics in the U.S. outside of Canada. So I think the big difference isn't actually necessarily attention or engagement. It's just how broad that attention and that engagement is among, among millennials. And I think it's just more dispersed than it was, uh, than it was before 20, 30 years ago. Ian, uh, you're the social media guru among us here. How are you seeing this? <laughs> I might also be the only millennial, uh, born <laughs> in 1980, proud millennial, uh, one of the first on Parliament Hill, and now one of the oldest millennials as well. And I think from that perspective, I can suggest that um, the entire generation isn't digitally native. And I think that there are a lot of digital disparities. In fact, depending on where you grew up geographically, uh, how well off your parents were, and the type of access to technology that you had in your secondary school and your university school are really important demographic markers of the millennial generation. So actually, the generation that I am most excited and spent a lot of time in my academic work looking at is actually Generation Z, or if you're an American, Generation Z. These are the voters, I actually believe that when we say so-called millennial voters tipped the Trudeau scales, I actually believe it was 18 and 19 year old voters. And now those folks are actually Generation Z. Also, they're the teaching for the first time ever. The, that generation is now the oldest of them. Um, in classrooms in the United States, and next year we'll be in classrooms in Canada. So we almost need a, a, a mind shift away from thinking of millennials as such a large demographic and really starting to break them down into um, slightly smaller cohorts that are, as Hamish Marshall suggested, I, I was really intrigued to hear Susan say that, um, are uh, tied a little bit more closely to life stage as well as socioeconomic factors. Um, those are things that I think are um, going to really tell the tale of digital natives because that population of so-called millennial voters, of course they're gonna vote all different ways. And guess what? Next election, they might not vote the same way they voted in the last election. In fact, the likelihood by all studies is that they may not. Indeed, because the days of us voting for the same party over and over and over again as our parents did or grandparents did, those days are long gone, aren't they? Well, it again, it depends on where you are. If you're on the island of Prince Edward Island, probably not. Huh. Um, okay. That is a cultural, that's a cultural expectation that's ingrained for many, many years. So, you know, the New Democrats, the party that I've worked most with, have grave difficulties with brand in that particular voting area versus other areas which perhaps, uh, you know, Doug Saunders, I think you had him on your show talking about arrival cities, mm -hmm. the notion of more highly transient populations. Those areas we definitely see um, you know, uh, are not bellwether ridings. Uh, they are jumping around in a way that is not predictable, um, and, and they're not stalwart ridings either. So we've got this other new brand of riding, which is a bit of an unpredictable beast. As we, though, Graham Steele, try to understand how millennials are relating to politics, I wonder if you could share with us that story you had in your book of somebody who you had a meeting with, It was, I think it was a constituent, and you were trying to explain the trade-offs that you were naturally involved in as Minister of Finance, they wanted a lot of information and money for education. You tried to explain how, well, health care is kind of a big deal for me as well, and they just weren't interested in anything you had to say about that. Fill in the blanks, if you would, on that story. Yeah, that, that was when I was the, uh, the Minister of Finance here in Nova Scotia, and of course I met with a lot of interest groups. And one group that we met with were, uh, were student leaders, university and college student leaders. And of course, they wanted uh, certain <coughs> things. And, and as Minister of Finance, I wanted to say to them, look, I, I hear what you're saying. Here's the challenges that we have. Help me with the challenges, which is here in government, we have you know, our biggest, our biggest um, 
item in every budget is the health care system. Costs are rising rapidly. Health care is grabbing every single extra dollar that there is and a lot of dollars that there aren't. And later on, in a, a number of months later, I, I got a message from one of the student leaders who'd been in the room that day and he said to me, that, that's so insulting. You know, we came to you to talk about education and all you wanted to talk to us about was health. I thought I was, I was uh, trying to tell them, here's what's really going on. You know, here's the balance. Here's why you're not immediately getting what you want. But this is indicative, I think, of pretty much all interest groups who come in with that one thing that they want and don't realize that politics, really, the core of it, the essence of it, is about, is about the balance. Susan, let me follow up with you, because uh, I saw a quote here from a former foreign minister in Sweden who said some years ago, people are mobilized more by single issues that affect them rather than by the abstract, overarching ideologies espoused by parties. Does that ring true with you? Yeah, I think so. I, I've actually, in, in some moments, wondered whether we need political parties anymore. You know, um, you see, not a lot of good happens in politics because of political parties, um, much as I, I have a lot of admiration for politicians, a lot of respect for them. Um, but it's the partisan aspect of politics that turns people off. Uh, and you see these uh, studies from Samara where people, I, I haven't read Graham's book yet, but I'm going to, people at the end of their political life, um, their big regrets are what they did for partisan, uh, for the sake of partisanship. So I think, uh, yeah, I think we're going to be moving more toward that because basically being a liberal or a conservative or a new Democrat is not something that, that most people identify with. I think, what is it? Fewer than 5% of Canadians belong to political parties. Uh, the Liberals have done away with the idea of membership. I actually think that maybe we should be looking at a day where federal government and provincial government works like municipal government with no political parties whatsoever. Interesting. Peter Lowen, I've... You know, it's uh, funny, we... Go ahead. Who's... Oops. Is that Ian? Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's always important to know where we have precedent for this in Canada. And let's just look north to Nunavut, you mm -hmm. know, our most recent territory. Um, you know, Inuit um, very much believe in consensus-based government and also go one step further. They, they elect their premier from those individuals who are elected to that. So perhaps we could, in fact, in this era of you know, post-TRC and reconciliation, take some inspiration. Um, as we move from the center block to the west block, um, the literal seat of our governance is changing. So I think Susan is incredibly... Um, um, sort of, uh, you know, um, almost f uh, f telling the future uh, as almost a futurist uh, only could who's been on the Hill for so long. Um, and I think it's actually very telling that somebody who's observed politics for as long as Susan has through that lens of Ottawa partisanship could in fact envision a Canadian future where we drop this almost falseness of these party colors that we, we pretend in question period and other places exist. because very correctly, less than 5%, in fact, less than 2.5% of Canadians belong to any form of political party. Peter, can you imagine millennials leading us into a new generation of politics where there are no more political parties? No. No, I mean, I mean, there, you, 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 there's a couple of things to say about it. I don't, want to be tr I don't want to be too flippant about it, but you want to make a distinction between partisanship and, and the, the depth and, and the degree of partisanship we have might be undesirable, right? I mean, there are arguments for it, actually, but the degree to which we divide ourselves on partisan lines, purely on the arbitrary marker of what party you identify with is a bit, is a bit silly. But you know, parties, you know, parties aren't a part of our constitution. Parties weren't mandated by law. Parties emerged and they evolved for a reason. They serve a function. Political world is chaotic. There are literally an infinite number of issues that you could confront as a politician. You have to find a way to organize those. And the notion that, um, that there's some other model out there in a world with any degree of high-level, multi-dimensional political complexity that can be solved by individuals self-organizing again and again and again, it's just not going to. It's just not going to occur. The one thing I would note is, you know, we do have, as Ian notes, we do have two cases in in, in parliaments in Canada, where we, which are nonpartisan parliaments. They're they're two of perhaps a half dozen around the world, and even one of them, the Northwest Territories, has decided over time that they'll run that parliament in an oppositional fashion where there's a cabinet and where there's an opposition. They get away from having parties because they've got, you know, something on the order of 10 or 11 
constituencies. So I just think, I mean, it's nice the idea that, you know, parties don't serve a function, but it turns out that they do, right? They organize the chaos of the political world, and there is not another competitor to them that's going, that's, you know, it's going to emerge. I could be totally wrong, but, uh, but there's a good reason why we have parties, and there's a good reason why parties have emerged like in every part of the world where there's democracy. Yeah. And I think there's, I think there's two can phenomena can going on here. Um, Let me get uh, Ed first I, I, and then Susan. I think there's two phenomena going on here at the same time. One is that uh, I agree with, uh, with, uh, with Peter that you know, parties aren't going to disappear, but parties are easy to capture now. Parties are, you know, vessels that somebody can, you know, take uh, the steering wheel of uh, uh, in the bridge. And we saw that with Donald Trump and the Republican Party. We see that uh, in other instances because really the communications function of the party um, is, is the key thing and the branding on top of the party. The other phenomenon I think that's going on is, you know, trends don't, um, unfortunately, in Canada come from our north. They come from our south uh, more, uh, more often than not. And, you know... Polarization is 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 a reality. The and I think it's a reality that is um, exacerbated or egged on by a digital world in which is you know a very judgmental world, a, a world where you know you're quick to come to uh, views where opinion is over fact, where you know almost to uh, uh, if I put in different words something Peter said in, uh, at the beginning of the show where freedom is greater and freedom of choice is greater than we've ever had, but commonweal and uh, setting, settling on a common set of issues is, is, is much more difficult That's to right. have. So this, you, know, you can see the trend in the United States and you see polls where people's asked, you know, do you just generally identify with Republicans, Democrats, or as an independent? And from 1994 to today, the independents basically disappear. It's not that they're active in those parties, but they have ideologies that, uh, that you know, tend to align with the party, and the middle ground is, uh, is uh, harder to hold. Susan. Yeah, uh, collectively, I think, Katie, and I want to point out here from Ottawa that there is a Senate right now functioning, uh, I believe, the number of non-affiliated, non-partisan senators now outnumber the partisans. Uh, so we're actually seeing, and the Senate has become effective and interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it can happen. Um, and um, but but, 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 also, in the United States, I think... I think what I don't like about partisanship and uh, is that it's a guarantee of a... Uh, Justin Trudeau doesn't have to work to get his MPs to support anything. They just have to support him. And I think it's the, the predictable, not like Congress, for example, where there is an, a discussion held about votes. It's, uh, it's, it's the blind partisanship that kind of wrecks politics. There's only one of you here that's been elected, so I absolutely need to hear from Graham Steele now <laughs> on whether you can possibly imagine millennials leading us into this new nirvana of nonpartisan politics, um, which, which I think, Susan, is quite right. We're seeing more of in the Senate right now, and Ian's right. We have some of the examples of it uh, in the northern part of this country. Um, what do you think, Graham? Uh, parties aren't going to disappear anytime soon. Uh, they're they're, they're going to kick and scream to hold on to what they have. But I do think it's right that younger voters, by and large, don't feel the same kind of allegiance that their parents and grandparents did. And, and look, the, the statistics will show that the voter turnout, the rate of voter turnout among older voters is much higher than it is among younger voters. So. The parties are going to keep going after the older voter, the people who reliable vote the same way over and over and over again. And see, the younger voters are much more challenging, as, as we were saying earlier. There's, uh, they seem to be more interested in single issue voters, is single, single issues. They will align with the party. They will realign. They will disalign. They may not turn out at all. And this is tremendously challenging terrain for the political parties. And the older voters are much easier. The people who've always voted and always vote the same way. So no, parties aren't going to go anywhere uh, anytime soon. Katie, you get to watch the Senate more than the rest of us because you are there. Do you think this new, the largest block, uh, Susan's quite right, the largest block in the Senate right now is a new non-aligned block. They're not liberals, conservatives. They're independents. Is this the wave of the future? Well, I think it's, it's a fascinating experiment to watch. And it's also worth pointing out that, in fact, because of the constitutional requirements in the Senate, you have to be, uh, I think it's 40 years old. None of, the, none of them are millennials. And yet, I love watching the nonpartisan and the independent senators when they're confronted by something that's perfectly normal in partisan circles. Because there are still, there's still, uh, well, there's still the Conservative Party, which is aligned with the Conservative Caucus in the House. And there are the Senate Liberals, who are a separate caucus. They're not really, you know, they don't really take orders from the House Liberals anymore, but they still 
still operate as a caucus. And you watch the independents when they're sort of, you know, looking at these maneuvers and they're, they react like normal human beings would by, by just sort of saying, what on earth is going on? Why are you all being so ridiculous? Can we please just get back to work? And it's actually, it's a very healthy reality dose. But I don't think millennials necessarily have a monopoly on being uh, puzzled and basically over the whole partisanship thing. I don't really think it's so much an age issue as everyone sort of feels that way. Peter Lowen. Well, I mean, it's, I'll just note that, I mean, it's, it's, it's true that the Senate is working in a nonpartisan way. I'll just note two facts of it. I mean, no one in there is subject to electoral sanction. Right. None of them have to figure out how to collectively put forward a political agenda that they can then defend in an election. That's a nice position to be in. And the second thing is they don't actually set an agenda. They, they're very competent people, and they sit in the Senate, and for the most part, they wait for Parliament, organized around parties, at the House of Commons, to send up legislation that they can then react to. Put them in a scenario where they're the first mover, where they're expected to deliver policy, and they're expected to then defend that policy in front of voters. Give it a period of time, parties will reemerge. I mean, that's just, it's just the empirical trend around the world. So the Senate's a great experiment in what happens if you have unelected people who don't have to set an agenda, review legislation. No question it works well. I don't think it's an instructive uh, case for what the future of electoral democracy is going to look like. Okay. Susan, let me put a new issue on the table here, and that is um, you went to the Manning Conference the other day. I went to a conference at Ryerson the other day where uh, David Hurley, who was the co-chair of Kathleen Wynne's re-election campaign, or the campaign manager, I should say, basically said, I have a very difficult job going forward, and it wasn't for the reasons that you thought. His difficult job is that he knows that if his premier is going to get reelected, young people have to come out and vote for her. And he said the difficulty of trying to appeal to them is that they are getting information right now on social media in seven second videos, usually with the sound turned off. And he wondered how it was in heaven's name possible to have any kind of intelligent conversation with anybody under those circumstances. Can you help us with that? Huh. I don't think that's just David Hurley's problem. I actually think that's a problem for we in the media as well. Um, you know, I, when I first arrived in Ottawa, we know not that long ago, let's say, uh, I wrote basically 1,500 to 2,000 word stories every day uh, on obscure things like Senate reform. The idea that I could do that now, that that's, uh, that's how journalism works or, or political um, information is conveyed, is something that's very troubling to the journalism world too. How do we make, not make a living, but uh, um, uh, most journalists are in business just like um, the political reporting business anyway for much of the same reasons that politicians are. They actually like making a difference in the world and they like reporting on these things but it communicating in seven second videos is not journalism. And I'll get to you in a second but I do want to hear from Ian Capstick on this. I, I, I cannot imagine how the political parties can communicate with millennials who many of whom want to get their information in seven second vines on social media with the audio turned down. How do you make that happen? Yeah, I'm just going to note Vine's been dead for like a really long time and you know most millennials would know that. So, as, uh, you know, uh, well, I've just proved that I'm not a millennial I, and I'm close right, to dead. But that's, so, okay. But that's what I'm saying. So and and either is David Hurley and as and as much as I have an immense amount of respect for David's work, I think the Gandalf group does you know absolutely some of the best polling work I've ever seen. Um, and I understand what the data says and what the data says is that while yes, it starts with 7 seconds with the sound off, you've got to draw that um, millennial or th that young voter in. And when you take a look at some of the most successful um, media right now, it's the rise of the documentary. People will literally sit and watch uh, a two hour documentary, you know, called Objectified about, uh, you know, product design or Helvetica about one typeface. So I don't think the long form is dead at all. In fact, if you take a look at hit Hollywood movies, my heavens, they're only getting longer. So I think that what is happening here is sometimes we have. Uh, false precedence of um, uh, order. So sometimes we believe text is more valid than video. And guess what? In a seven second silent video, you can communicate a lot. I mean, anybody who's seen me on Power and Politics roll my eyes knows exactly what I'm thinking when I do that. So I think the other thing here is, is that as these younger minds um, are immersed in their te telephones a little bit more, um, as they take notes on laptops a little bit more, what we're starting to see is studies that suggest their comprehension uptake is actually not as good as well. So, so while 
I'm saying it's not entirely a problem. The, the actual flip side of the problem is one of comprehension, right? So in that instance, I fear that politics may become even more simplistic, right? Already it's a battle of the used to be 30 second soundbite, now 10 second soundbite. So my fear here is, is that we reduce partisanship to, you know, Trumpian like talking points, you know, them good, us bad, and the room for nuance isn't there. So the antidote to that is actually like Instagram Live. Um, so when you see Jagmeet Singh or Justin Trudeau, go on, on Instagram Live or Facebook Live and start interacting with people, that's what we should encourage our politicians to do. Because that means we can actually have that back and forth with them in that digital commons, in that you know, ideal, that, that utopian public sphere. Ed. Well, you know, I, I think we have an existential issue, and I, I keep wondering from time, you know, if the medium is the message, I would like to find Marshall McLuhan, pull him out of a movie line and say, <laughs> you know, what does this digital world mean Annie to Hall. us? Yeah. Uh, Annie, Annie Hall. Hall. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I don't see that kind of thinking in some ways going on. But I think there's, um, there's a, a few things we can say about it. You know, seven second clips, you can't get a lot of nuance. You can't get a lot of empathy. Um, uh, you know, it, it was a different world when you could really be debating issues, and I don't want to be crazy nostalgic. I use my smartphone a lot, but it's a superficial, quick kind of uh, uh, kind of relationship that you have with facts. There's built-in biases in there that I think would be the medium as the message kinds of ideas. Emotion works better than reason, um, whether it's uh, angry emotion or laughter emotion. This is one of the reasons why fake news tends to work better than mm -hmm. real news in, in some ways. Opinion works better than fact. It has, you know, biases that aren't, uh, aren't great. You may remember, Steve, and... Uh, uh, a book written, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s by Neil Postman called Amusing Ourselves to, to death. death. Yes. And the idea of amusing ourselves to death is this kind of conflation of entertainment and an image and the quick kind of image with people not doing the nuance of, uh, of that comes with reading, really, uh, would lead to a situation where um, society would actually erode its politics and intelligence of its politics, not in the way that George Orwell said, by authoritarianism, but in the way that um, Aldous Huxley said, by just so much entertainment and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and distraction. And, I, and I'm afraid, you know, I, I don't want to overstate that, but I'm afraid that's sort of the trend line of, uh, of what is in this medium. Steve, if I could just say, just Please. add one thing to what Ed said and, and what Ian said, and, and I think they're both, they've described the, the, the environment very well. But the thing I want to, I want to point out is that it is true that people consume news quicker and, and in smaller sound bites, and they're probably less nuanced, and there's probably less information in each of those individual pieces, but there's more news to consume. So the story 30 years ago was you had a local newspaper covered your local politics well. You, had, you made it get one of the national newspapers to your house, and you watched a f half an hour or a 40-minute news broadcast at the end of the day for which 15 minutes might be devoted to politics. And now people spend literally hours a day on social media, and they're getting exposed to a lot of information about politics over the course of that day. The aggregate of it is probably more than they were exposed to is before. It better though. Well that's the question, right? So 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 where it well, comes and some of it is better. You know some of it me is too better. me right. too couldn't exist without a digital world. Right. That's right. better. Those Florida students being right. able to right. you know get out their messages, that is better. It, There's a lot of things it, that are better, it, but I think built into into this is just less contemplation, yes, more judgment. Yes, yes. You know, There's factors that are uh, a, a dark side, I think, of, 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 of what's a positive demo democratizing experience that we have to just come to grips with, and I don't think we have yet. And, and at the same time, that we don't have enough regulations and other control around some of the algorithmic entities, Facebook, Twitter, and others, who are feeding us this information. So, you know, foreign actors like Russians within the U.S. elections and others have more opportunity to, to play with it because this space is not as, uh, as well regulated. And it's not as well regulated because it's not as well understood. I mean, I remember having to have three and four hour discussions when Twitter first came out about whether politicians should or should not join Twitter. I fear that we chose the wrong answer in some instances and we probably <laughs> should have kept them off of the medium. But, you know, really, I think that the key here is, is, is understanding that the very people who are legislating and regulating this haven't very well understood it for very long. And the one entity in Ottawa that has, the CRTC, is so divorced and devoid of politics, the vast majority of politicians are afraid of it. 
right? So, so I think the other thing that we need to do is have some sort of public policy recognition that the very legal and regulatory environment that we're in is no longer what it was when, when the, the Broadcast Act uh, was, was put out. So fundamentally, we, we have to play a very different style of security when it comes to these algorithmic entities. Let me get Katie to start off on this next chapter that I'm going to raise here, and then Graham will get you to follow up. And given that we're, <clears throat> given that we're here gathered together on the Ides of March, it seems appropriate to talk about um, what happened to Patrick Brown a couple of months ago, uh, the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, who may or may not have been knifed in the front or the back by his uh, caucus colleagues. Um, here's, wh here's where I'm going with this. It was Patrick Brown's party, and then it wasn't, and then he got back in the race, and then he got out, and then Doug Ford got in, and he won. And in spite of all of this, the PC party is still number one by a long shot in all of the public opinion surveys. And I guess what I'm wondering is, if we talk about the importance of political parties, Katie, when I was growing up in this province, we understood that the big blue machine was the party of Frost and Robarts and Davis. We understood that it was more than just whoever happened to be at the head of it at the moment. Are those days gone? Is this now the Doug Ford party, not the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario with 80 years of history behind it? Uh, well, I guess he's been on the job, what, a week? So perhaps we should let him, you know, do something before we decide what direction he's going to take the party in. Um, what I wonder, actually, is while we who are political junkies tend to pay attention to every every plot twist and everything that has happened to the Ontario PC party or any party that was going through what we saw over the last month, I kind of wonder whether or not the population at large was as fascinated by it, which is why I, it'll be interesting to see if those numbers hold on and if there's a, a, a gradual shift. Because one thing that tends to show up in polling is it takes time for a, a collective change in opinion to really start to show in those numbers. And the way it's going, it could be starting to percolate right about the time that Ontarians are actually going to go for the biggest, most important poll of all, which is, of course, the, the election poll. So, I mean, in that sense, I think we don't know how this is all going to kind of play out. At the same time, it's also, and as, as Canadians, we look south of the border, we look at the primary system, and sometimes we get that confused with our leadership system and how parties choose their leaders. That cannot be viewed as sort of something you can just transpose onto the province as a whole, because it really is a very self-selecting group, more so with this race than most, because it was done so abruptly and so quickly and over such a short period of time. So on that sense, I think I think it's a, it's a giant unknown, and we really don't know how it's all going to play out. And it could turn out, uh, you know, Doug Ford could easily become an odd footnote in Canadian political history where people think, jeepers, there was that guy that was leader of the party for a year. That was weird. Or he could be premier for a decade. You just don't know. Yeah, but Graham, you know, people are today saying it's not the Republican Party anymore. It's the Trump Party. People in Ontario are now saying it's not necessarily the PC Party. It's the Ford Party. Or, uh, you know, it's not the Liberal Party of uh, David Peterson and Stuart Smith. It's the Wynn Party. Uh, do you think there's been that kind of sea change in the way that we regard our political parties now? Yeah, I really do. I mean, there are some things that simply don't change about politics. And one of the most powerful forces in politics is when people decide it's time for a change. And that seems to be go what's going on in Ontario. And it doesn't seem to matter who is leading the Ontario uh, PC party if the voters have decided that it's time for a change. But the other thing that's going on is, is kind of what you put your finger on there is that you know, I, I'm old enough to remember when people were saying how television, the advent of television, was putting a focus on leaders at the expense of the party. Well, today in the Twitter age, the Snapchat age, that's even more the case than it ever was, where the entire focus of the population in the United States is what is Donald Trump going to tweet today? Now, that's all very well, you know, when you're an opposition party and you're trying to bring down a government. But what concerns me the most is how this, um, this change in the use of technology and the impact on the electorate and the impact on parties is not compatible with the complexity of government. I mean, it, it is compatible with winning an election, which is what the strategists are thinking about. That's their job, is to win an election. But at the end of the day, you've got to run a healthcare system and an education system and a transportation system and what I fear the most, Steve, is that people, uh, people elected to office will just be less ready for that job than ever. Hmm. Peter. Here's a, here's a very uh, deeply anti-democratic notion. But the, the, the problems that you're describing, the antidote to those problems are stronger political parties. 
not political parties stronger in the sense that they've got more members, but political parties that are stronger in the sense that they have traditions about what they believe. They may have competing factions within them. They have powerful members who are elected to parliaments, and those members have influence over who's selected. And those members, and that party as a corporate entity, carries forward an ideology that can change over time, but isn't merely at the whim of the leader. I mean, we think that parties are a bad thing, but that party you're describing, the, the rule on terror for 42 years, is one which evolved over time in reaction to the leaders, but those leaders had to reconcile themselves to those parties. That described the Liberal Party for a long time in Canada, where it had a core set of beliefs, and leaders had to reconcile themselves to at least some of those, some of those beliefs or some of those political commitments or ideology or whatever you want to call them. The solution here to this sort of thing is not less powerful parties. It's parties that are actually able to keep out outsiders who come in and hijack them and instead ask people to be leaders of a party that has certain beliefs. But the rule, Susan, I'm going to get you to weigh in on this. The, the rules now permit, quote unquote, the hijacking of parties by single interest groups, um, single issue interest groups now because it's one person, one vote and, and you can take over a party. That's the way it goes now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised we haven't been talking. We should talk about uh, party financing in all of this too. That is a, it, it's not just people you have to mobilize. It's money. Uh, again, I'm gonna. So I, th I think we were better off in the days of. Uh, the public subsidy for the parties because basically politicians are turned into fundraising machines. They're out there. We have done away with corporate donations and uh, union donations and uh, large scale donations. Often those donors gave the party the stability you're talking about. You notice no political party in Ottawa now wants to be aligned with big business um, or Bay Street or wants to be a friend of, of uh, the corporate world because they don't need their donations anymore. And I think that, that makes things a little more volatile as well, that parties are moving now where the money is and it's lots of individual donations and it's, a, it's an erratic kind of um, system. Hmm. I, I think this comes back also, a, a very important point Graham said about governing, because ultimately the point here is comp of political competition, who is going to govern. And, um, you know, these small donations that, uh, that Susan talks about, that, you know, you're appealing usually to the extremes of parties. Again, you're appealing through motion. You're trying to get um, the person who's going to get really riled by this or that. But once you get in government, you're trying to build bridges. You're trying to build consensus in some ways to, uh, to move forward. So the system is working at... Uh, at cross purposes. Parties used to play the role of brokering differences. Now that's not really their role anymore. Now they're just vessels for yeah. collecting money, putting out messages and advertising, getting a brand, and sometimes that brand could be a Donald Trump, mm -hmm. a Justin Trudeau, a pre-existing, a Doug Ford, a pre-existing brand actually uh, helps the party, gives it a head start. We've got about four minutes left here and I want to put one more issue on the table and get everybody to weigh in on this. Do you think, Ian, you're the millennial here, so let's start with you. Do you think the next generation offers any reason to think that liberal democracy is actually in good hands nowadays? All we got to do is take a look at the United States and the incredible theater kids, GSA kids, and others who led that incredible walkout yesterday. Uh, and they're going to do it again, and they're going to do it over and over and over again. And I think that's what real digital natives are like. Um, I've, I've had uh, an in incredible... A chance in the last election to work with some of the youngest voters in the country. In fact, some folks who hadn't even had the chance to actually officially cast a ballot, and they inspire me beyond anything that I have ever seen. And I don't know, maybe that's just me getting older and, and, and getting more wistful and optimistic as I age. Um, but I'm not more pessimistic, that's for sure. Um, I'm, I'm wary um, of, of extremism within young people as well, though. Um, I think that sometimes extremely held beliefs, whether on the very far left or the very far right, can sometimes also be very dangerous. And, and the youngest of us are sometimes prone to that. Graham, what are you seeing down east? Well, uh, when I uh, became Nova Scotia's finance minister, I had been in opposition for eight years, and it, it didn't do me any good. I mean, I, I knew maybe 10% of what I needed to know to govern. So what I worry about more than anything, Steve, is what I said before, is that our parties are primed to, to win um, the, and they do that by agitating people, you know, whipping people up to raise money, but they're not ready to govern, and they're less ready to govern now than they ever were, and, and, and that's the concern. Katie, what are you seeing? Um, well, 
I think that's a lot of pressure to put on the millennials to begin with. Uh, perhaps we should all take a, you know, our, our, our part in, in bringing back some decency and decorum to our politics. I don't know. I'm also pretty optimistic. I think that the sea changes that happen, I, I, again, I'll say this, I think it does tend to bleed over from one demographic. I don't think these are all like age silos where no one talks to anyone else and no one is influenced by anyone else. I think older people can be influenced by younger people and vice versa. So in that sense, I really think uh, the technology has almost become, the platforms have become age independent or demographic independent in the sense that everyone can have access to the same material and to the same sources of inspiration. So while, you know, yeah, you, you watch things like the walkout in the United States and that is, you know, enormously inspiring, but then you look at the reaction from people, you know, from in, the, in their 20s, 30s, 40s and up who are also congratulating those kids and saying, go you, that this is awesome to see. So it's not as though it's them against the world in a lot of cases. It's more like everyone is working together towards something. And Susan, I will note that at the PC leadership convention last weekend, uh, I probably spoke to a half a dozen candidates for the next election who are in their 20s. And that's just candidates. There were certainly a lot more young people who were there who were not intending to be candidates, but were just into politics. Um, that's a good sign, I guess, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, and may I just point out that the biggest menace on Twitter in the Western civilized world is an older man, 70 years old. <laughs> uh, it's Donald Trump who's wrecking social media. Um, so I, I do a little bit of work at uh, Carleton University I have, um, with journalism students and the School of Political Management there. And when I see those students, I think things are going to be okay. Ed? Well, uh, I think things are always going to be okay. And when we're in a country like Canada, we're debating between uh, uh, the good and the very good and, uh, in some ways. Having said that, I worry about the uh, rise of hyperpartisanship. I worry about uh, the loss, uh, a breakdown in some ways of the pluralism of, of people working out their differences, coming uh, to, a, uh, uh, to a solution that they're not perfectly satisfied with, but reasonably satisfied with. I think that's exacerbated by, uh, by digital filter bubbles and echo chambers. And I think we have to therefore probably use policy to build uh, informational bridges that are more common that people can share. Last 30 seconds to you. Uh, yeah. Three quick points. One is that d democracy is actually not having a great run globally right now. Uh, it's, it's in the worst shape it's ever been since the beginning of the 1990s, and that should worry us. And that's partially because of global forces. The second is, is that I think that you know, celebrity governance and governance by people based on image is not a desirable thing, and we're actually farther down that road in our country than we would, than we would probably like and than we probably should be. And the third thing is, is that, is that we are in a culture that doesn't, I think, appreciate all of the bargains that are inherent in, in, in politics, all the patience that's inherent in it, all the expertise that's needed. And we need to, and that's really what Graham's book is about, we need to kind of rebuild an appreciation for what politicians do and an ability to hold them to a higher standard. And I'm not, I'm not Pollyannish on our ability to do that, actually. So I'll finish on a more pessimistic note than uh, my Well, colleagues. if you're talking about appreciation, let me just say how much I appreciated reading The Effective Citizen, How to Make Politicians Work for You. Graham Steele, great having you on the program. Ian Capstick, Katie O'Malley, Susan Delacorte, Edward Greenspawn, Peter Lowen. Boy, a cast of thousands here on the agenda tonight. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.